Hi, my name is Katie Connor. I've been working in PA education for about 10 years now. I'm also an orthopedic surgery PA in Charleston, South Carolina. Today, we're going to be talking about the infectious disease objectives. This is part of our 13-part series to help make didactic year a little bit easier and help you to ace your boards. So let's take a look at our objectives. Lots of objectives in this unit. They're all listed in alphabetical order here, but we're actually going to start with the only prion disease, which is Creutzfeldt jakob or mad cow disease. For this question, there must be some kind of contact with infected brain tissue. So either consumption of infected cattle or somebody that has physically touched the brain. So surgical instruments used on the brain, EEG electrodes, corneal transplants, dura mater grafts, and then human pituitary hormones can be sources of this. In the question, they must tell you that there's some kind of contact there because this is a diagnosis of exclusion. It's not common. So perhaps they would describe an autopsy in the question. For the history, rapidly progressive dementia that presents in physical exam findings that are neurologic in nature, ataxia, cerebellar dysfunction, and myoclonic jerking. This is the most common prion disease, but it's very rare in general. In the question, look for the occupations of medical examiner, forensic pathologist, or mortician because they would have been in proximity to that brain tissue. This is absolutely a diagnosis of exclusion, and the only treatment is supportive. From diagnosis to death is about eight months. Now let's move on to our fungal diseases. The first one that we're gonna talk about is cryptococcosis. It is very important as we go through these slides that you understand the scientific names, so genus and species of the etiologies for these disorders. For example, this is Cryptococcus neoformans. In cryptococcosis, this is inhaled spores of a yeast, Cryptococcus neoformans, and it presents in bird and bat feces. This is most likely to cause neurological findings. It can also cause a respiratory finding, but neurological is gonna be the most common. It is a causative agent of meningitis. So headache and fever with papilledema and nuchal rigidity would be the presentation of the meningitis form. Non-productive cough, cough and pleuritic type of chest pain with rails would be the presentation of the respiratory type of symptom symptoms. And then a pustular skin rash is something that is also associated with this disease. For your fungal diseases, you should always be thinking about immunocompromised patients. So HIV, AIDS, organ uh, transplant, or chronic immunosuppression with steroids. It's always important to look at that occupation, like in our last disorder. So demolition crews or farmers, they would be more likely exposed to this yeast. This disease is more common along the Pacific coast because that's where eucalyptus trees are more likely to be found. And that is a common uh, area in the life cycle of this disease is eucalyptus trees. So think about Pacific coast, demolition crews, farmers, and meningitis type of symptoms for this one. If they're having neurologic type of symptoms, a lumbar puncture would be appropriate. Sputum culture would be appropriate if they're having more respiratory symptoms. There is an antibody titer that can be drawn, or you can do a biopsy of that pustular lesion that occurs in that skin rash. We would treat this with an oral antifungal, something like amphotericin B. Next, we have histoplasmosis. This is kind of similar in the fact that it's an inhaled yeast. Histoplasma capsulatum, this is a fungus that occurs again in that bird and bat feces. It is inhaled. It grows into a yeast. This one is going to be more respiratory symptoms, whereas cryptococcosis is more neurological meningitis type of symptoms. 90% of patients with histoplasmosis are asymptomatic. They don't even know that they have it because typically it self-resolves within about four weeks. But if they are immunocompromised, they may present with respiratory symptoms. So dyspnea, dry or productive cough, hemoptysis, and night sweats. There's a maculopapular kind of a finer rash with this one, whereas the pustular rash is more associated with the cryptococcosis. The cryptococcosis was the Pacific Coast. This one is found more in the Ohio, Missouri, and Mississippi River valleys because they have an ideal soil composition and moisture content for this yeast to grow. Sputum and blood cultures would be diagnostic. An antibody titer would be a good test. And then a chest x-ray, it may be nonspecific, but hilar masses are more likely to be found in somebody with histoplasmosis. 
Like I said, most of these cases will resolve within about four weeks, but if it persists longer than four weeks, you would consider an antifungal like amphotericin B. Pneumocystis gerevechii pneumonia. This used to be called Pneumocystis carini, but this species was only found to infect rats. So we know Pneumocystis gerevechii affects humans. These are fungal spores, and this is the most common respiratory infection in AIDS. So that should be something you should be looking for in the question that it's an AIDS patient. Weight loss, dyspnea, severe dry cough, because the sputum is so thick, they can't expectorate it. When we have decreased respiratory effort, so tachypnea, fever, decreased oxygen saturation because that mucus is plugging the airways. We talked about this as the most common uh, respiratory infection in AIDS and other immunocompromised patients. Sputum culture would be diagnostic if they're able to get the sputum out. A highly distinctive test for this one is a positive beta D glucan test. This, this is an assay that detects the fungal cell wall presence. On chest x-ray, it's not a great picture there, but you can see diffuse perihilar infiltrates. And when you do a CT scan, it will look at, like this kind of frosted glass or ground glass appearance. The treatment of choice for this and a common exam question on this one is going to be Bactrim. Steroids can also be used to promote the uh, lung function. And the mortality rate because it's in an AIDS patient is about 20% on this disease. Now let's move on to our helminthic or our worm diseases. The first one we're going to talk about is pinworms because it's super common and commonly tested on the boards. This is Enterobias vermicularis, and this is transmitted by the fecal oral route. What happens is that the females come out of the anus at night and cause itching. And so the child, which is more common in children, scratches around the anus and then puts their finger in, the in their mouth in the morning. And that's why you have this transmission of this. So nocturnal perianal paritis is very specific for pinworms. On physical exam, you may note the areas where the child has been itching the anus. You may actually see a worm. They're less than about one centimeters in size, and it's a perianal white worm. This is by far the most common helminthic infection, which is why it's highly tested on the boards. 30% of kids ages 5 to 14 will have this at some point in their life, and is much more common in crowded living conditions or uh, things like daycare, where they're constantly touching each other. The scotch tape test for this is pretty self-explanatory. You put a piece of scotch tape over the anus at night, and when you take it off in the morning, you either see the worm, the eggs, or the fecal material of the worms. This is treated with an antihelminthic, mebendazole or albendazole. You want to make sure that you also treat everybody in the household because it's so highly contagious. You want to clean all of the linens in hot water to sterilize them because these can live on sheets and linens. You want to prevent this with frequent hand washing is the best way to prevent this. Let's go to our intestinal helminth infestations. That's going to be hookworm, tapeworm, and ascarid worms. With hookworms, these are found in the feces of infected animals. So the feces of infected animals end up on the ground. Somebody who comes along barefoot walks over that, and then the hookworm larvae go through the skin and they work their way into the intestines. These are the two scientific names of the most common species that affect humans. So think about walking barefoot and an iron deficiency anemia, because as they kind of hook into the intestines, they cause this small amount of bleeding. And so you will eventually get an iron deficiency anemia. This is not very common in the United States. I want to be clear on that. So walking barefoot, infected pets or animals in the area, and iron deficiency anemia should clue you into hookworm. Tapeworm. Tapeworm is commonly found in undercooked pork and beef, not so much in seafoods. This one will reside in the intestines. This is the second picture here, and it will grow and grow and grow and grow, and it will release the segments into the feces, and that's how it continues its life cycle. There's one large kind of head-like looking uh, part at the top, and then the rest of it is all segmental. So think undercooked pork, undercooked beef. This one can lead to weight loss and malnutrition because the tape is the tapeworm is taking all of the nutrients out of the food intake. Ascarid worms are large white roundworms, and they come in to the body from the contaminated uh, soil. They could be on the food or hands. It becomes ingested, and then they grow and multiply in the intestines. 
At first, they can cause a malnutrition because all the nutrients are going to the worms. But the secondary complications of these is that they reproduce so much that you can actually get an intestinal blockage from all of the worms that have reproduced in that area. Next, we have fluke and trichinosis. With fluke, these are the two most common scientific names for this. This comes in through contaminated water. The fluke gets in, it burrows through the skin. This is more common in undercooked seafood. So think more uh, tapeworm for beef and pork and think more flukes for seafood. So fish, crabs, and crayfish. The flukes can be found in four different places of the body. So that's a good exam question there. So intestines, the blood, the lungs, and the liver are common areas where the flukes will go as kind of their endpoints. Trichinosis. Trichinosis is a worm that affects mostly muscle tissue and brain tissue, and it encapsulates in these areas. So it's very difficult to treat. You can see a cross section of a muscle biopsy here, and all those little circles, those are encapsulated worms. This is most likely to be found in raw or undercooked pork. So remember, intestines, blood, lung, liver for fluke, and muscle and brain for trichinosis. Next, we have filariad worms that we'll talk about. And there's three main types here. You have filariasis, the guinea worm, and the loa loa worm. Filariasis causes elephantiasis, which is the top picture here. Wuchiaria bancrofti, this is the most common filariad worm. It buries into the lymphatic system and it blocks the lymphatic tract. So all of the lymphatic fluid pools where gravity takes it, which is in the lower extremities. After a while, all of that lymphatic pooling will cause skin breakdown in those areas. Next, we have the guinea worm, which is the picture there. You can see this little tiny worm that's wrapped around a matchstick. And the reason is if you directly pull on the worm when the head emerges through the skin, it will break and it will cause a secondary infection. So draconiolysis is the disease term for the guinea worm. It buries into the body through contaminated water sources and it resides in the skin where the head will poke out it has to be removed a very slow amount of, the, of time, and that causes a very burning, very painful experience for the patient. If that worm breaks, again, it can lead to infection. So this is a slow and torturous removal of that worm. The loa loa worm, this is a filariad worm that can be transmitted by the bite of a fly, so a mango or a deer fly. This will reside in the eye, and this is kind of a particularly creepy one. So filariad worms think more lymphatic system. Guinea worms think more skin, and the loa loa worm think eye. Next, let's move on to our viral diseases. Let's start with the tropical viral fever. So we have dengue fever and yellow fever. Let's start with the history of these, which is pretty similar. So they share in common myalgias, malaise, and headache, kind of nonspecific. 80% of dengue fever patients are asymptomatic. On physical exam, both of them can have fever and both of them can cause a petechial rash. So they share that in common. In dengue fever, they will usually have a mild form of mucosal bleeding if they have bleeding at all. Whereas in yellow fever, 15% of patients will develop jaundice, jaundice, yellow skin, AKA yellow fever. Then they will go on to have mucosal and severe GI bleeding, which can cause hypotension and death. So think more severe feeding, more severe mucosal bleeding in yellow fever. Both of these are, are uh, spread by the Aedes mosquito and it has an incubation of about one week. In the dengue uh, fever, this is caused by a dengue virus, 5% of patients will develop a hemorrhagic type of GI bleeding. The yellow virus is caused by a flavivirus and 15% of these patients will go on to have hepatic failure or liver failure. Both of these diseases are endemic to Latin America, Southeast Asia, and Africa. On CBC, both of these can cause a neutropenia and a thrombocytopenia. Both of them can be diagnosed with a PCR or an ELISA, but in third world countries, they may not have that. Treatment for this is typically symptomatic. IV fluids and acetaminophen if they have a mild case. If they have active mucosal bleeding, you can treat that with fresh frozen plasma, but you wanna prevent this with the vaccines that are available to people in those endemic areas. As far as the prognosis, dengue takes a little longer to resolve. So 10 days to self-resolving. 
If the patient has a, a GI bleed, the mortality is 25%. Without the GI bleed, it's only 1%. And again, 80% of those are asymptomatic. In yellow fever, this is a shorter duration, so about five days for resolving, but it is a higher rate of mortality. If the patient develops jaundice, the mortality rate ranges from 20 to 50%. If they don't develop jaundice, the mortality rate is three to 7%. Next, let's talk about Ebola virus or viral hemorrhagic fever. This one is highly, highly contagious. This one was spread from an infected primate, from hunting and eating that primate, and then it became an, uh, something that occurred in the human population. This virus is transmitted in any bodily fluid, and the incubation period is 2 to 21 days, so a relatively long incubation period where they are contagious the entire time. So that's why you get a rapid spreading of this disease, because they don't know they're contagious until they're already you know, 21 days into it, and they've infected so many people already. For the history, headache, diarrhea, vomiting, abdominal pain, kind of nonspecific findings, but you should look for travel to the endemic area in the question. So usually a healthcare worker that has traveled to Africa, that's the key demographic that you're looking for in that question. On physical exam, high fever, rash, ciliary injection, bloodshot eyes, internal and external bleeding. As this disease progresses in the later stage, they'll go into liver and renal failure. Then they develop bleeding out of every orifice, so eyes, ears, and nose, hence the viral hemorrhagic fever. On CBC, you'll see a thrombocytopenia. Coagulation panel, you'll have prolonged bleeding times, PT and PTT. The diagnostic test for this is going to be a PCR or an ELISA, but again, that's not always present in these third world countries. Treatment is going to be supportive, IV fluids, oxygen, this has a high mortality rate, 50 to 90% mortality within six to 16 days of symptom onset. The only drug that we have is still currently experimental and that's remdesivir. Zika virus. Zika virus is something that's been more recently in the news within the last 10 years. Zika virus is a flavivirus that is transmitted again by that mosquito vector, but it's a sexually transmitted disease. So it's transmitted by the partner to a pregnant woman. 80% of people who have this are asymptomatic, but you look for in the history, some kind of travel to the endemic areas, which include Africa, Southeast Asia, South America, Virgin Islands, and Puerto Rico. It's going to include in the question, some kind of pregnant woman, because we know that the consequences of Zika are, terog are terogenic, teratogenicity, excuse me, sorry. So they cause birth defects in, in the baby of the pregnant woman. So it's sexually transmitted, tropical endemic areas. And if it happens in a pregnant woman, microcephaly, so a smaller head and eye deformities are the most common findings. Hantavirus. Hantavirus is another inhaled virus. This is the sin nombre virus in rodent waste. So you see examples of the deer mouse and the cotton rat there. There's two stages of hantavirus. You have the prodrome, which is going to be more GI symptoms. And then you have the cardiopulmonary phase, which is going to be more respiratory symptoms. So the prodrome, three to five days of vomiting, diarrhea, and abdominal pain. And then you progress to dyspnea and a dry cough. The physical exam findings for these are nonspecific. Rails are nonspecific uh, respiratory findings and dehydration from the GI side effects or the symptoms. Sunken eyes, decreased skin turgor, dry mucous membranes are all nonspecific. Hantavirus is much more common in arid and dusty climates. So look for some kind of desert climate in that question. On smear, you may see atypical lymphocytes. And then the diagnostic criteria, the definitive test is an ELISA with an elevated IgM and IgG or a PCR test. So genetic testing for this virus. Treatment is supportive and then ventilation. You wanna make sure when they're in that cardiopulmonary phase that they're still getting enough oxygen and they're not going into respiratory distress. Infectious mononucleosis. This one we covered in your ENT unit as well. This is an Epstein-Barr virus that infects the B lymphocytes. In the history of mono, it's usually gonna be a teenager because they're more common to be kissing. This is the kissing disease, sharing drinks, sharing food. They're gonna present with extreme fatigue, 
pharyngitis. Look at that top picture there. They have these massive tonsillar exudates. So cervical lymphadenopathy, tonsillar exudates, splenomegaly because the spleen starts eating up all of those infected cells and it becomes enlarged. They may have a fever, jaundice, faint transient rash, and then uh, the, they may get petechiae on their soft palate. On CBC, you may see a leukocytosis, smear, that's that second picture there, that's atypical lymphocytes. That's what's happening in infectious mononucleosis, so that's pretty specific. The heterophile screening test is a blood test that can be done in the clinic. Most people call it the monospot test, but that's a brand name. So you know on the boards, they will not ask a brand name. So the heterophile test is the test that's definitive for this. You can also find an elevated Epstein-Barr virus, IgM, if you're looking at a titer. Treatment for this is supportive. Anti-inflammatories and rest. This will self-resolve ranging from 10 days to a more protracted three months. Here's a key exam question. No contact sports because of the risk of splenic rupture because we have splenomegaly. Interestingly enough, if this gets misdiagnosed as, you know, they don't do a swab, they say, oh, it's strep and they're given penicillin, the patient will develop a rash. So that's more of a clinical just pearl than it is an exam question. Cytomegalovirus. This one is very common. 90% of humans will get this during their lifetime. It's a DNA human beta herpes virus, and it's transmitted in any bodily fluid, so it's highly contagious. If this occurs in an immunocompromised patient, it can cause a lot of secondary complications, hepatitis, retinitis, colitis, pneumonitis, esophagitis, and encephalitis. So you look at those secondary complications in immunocompromised patients. The history and the physical, completely nonspecific. Flu-like symptoms, sore throat, fever, cer cervical lymphadenopathy, could be anything. What makes this specific and what your exam questions will focus on is the smear. They have something called an owl's eye cell. It looks like an, uh, an owl's eye. A PCR and ELISA are definitive, but that's hardly ever done on this. So in the question, you have to look at what can they formulate for a question here? So they're gonna mention that owl's eye on the smear. IVIG can be given if it's very severe or in, in, a, in an immunocompromised patient. You can also give an antiviral in an immunocompromised patient. What makes this a good exam question here besides that owl's eye is that it can be teratogenic in pregnancy. It's one of your torch infections. So it can cause cognitive and motor defects in that baby. Next, HIV and AIDS. There are a lot of board questions that come from this one. So let's spend a little time on this one. Let's look at etiology first. HIV-1 is going to be the most common form of this. This originated in the 1920s in the Democratic Republic of Congo from inf uh, eating infected primates. It was transmitted to humans. We know that this is a blood-borne disorder. So mother to child, IV needles from drug users, needle sticks, genital ulcers, and rough sex. One of the most common exam questions on here, let's skip up to the history part of this. Who is the most likely or what behavior is the most likely to transmit and receive HIV? Receptive anal sex, because they're less likely to use protection because you can't get pregnant with anal sex. Also the mucosa of the anus is not as stretchy as it is in the vagina. So it's more friable, it bleeds, you get more cracks in there and that causes an opening for the virus to get in there. Other things in the history look for multiple sexual partners that are unprotected, other STDs, IV drug use, transfusions prior to 1985 because we didn't screen for that. That's not gonna be probably in the question. There's three phases of this. You have the prodrome, which is four, two to four weeks post-exposure, nonspecific, flu-like illness, truncal rash, neuropathy, and diarrhea. Then you progress into the clinical latency where you really don't have a whole lot of symptoms for three to 20 years post-exposure, but you are contagious. Fever, weight loss, and lymphadenopathy are gonna be the most common findings during that phase. And then we progress to AIDS. If untreated, 50% of HIV patients will progress to AIDS within 10 years. This is where we start to see the opportunistic infections. And these are good exam questions here. Kaposi sarcoma, Burkitt lymphoma, thrush, pneumocystis pneumonia, tuberculosis, toxoplasmosis, shingles, and dementia.
The most common epidemiology for this is going to be sub-Saharan Africa. But remember that men who have sex with men is a high risk demographic because anal sex and they're less likely to use protection and that anal mucosa is more friable. Also think about this in IV drug users, especially those who share needles. Your diagnostic definitive test for this is going to be a PCR or an ELISA. CD4 T cell count is also important because this indicates the risk of opportunistic infections. Here's a good exam question. A CD4 T cell count less than 200 is definitive for AIDS. That's a good exam question. The prognosis if the patient has uh, heart therapy, highly active antiretroviral therapy is normal life expectancy. Without treatment, prognosis is 10 years. We know that condom use can decrease the risk for HIV by 80% and antiviral vaginal gels can decrease the risk by 40%. There's a new class of medications out now called pre-exposure prophylaxis that can be given to people in those high risk categories. The brand name for that is Truvada. If you're a healthcare worker or somebody who has been exposed, you have the option to do a three antiviral drug combo that's called post-exposure treatment. So that's given 48 to 72 hours after known exposure. Next, let's talk about rabies. This is super rare. It only causes two human deaths annually. This is a central nervous system acting lysivirus and dogs and cats are the most common reservoir. That's a good exam question there. We can also see this in other mammals like bats, skunks, coyotes, wolves, foxes, and raccoons. In the history for this, there's gonna be some kind of aggressive animal that bit the patient one to three months before the onset of symptoms. And it's gonna cause a triad paresthesia, pain, and intense itching at the bite site. That's really important. That's a good exam question. Paresthesia, pain, and intense itching. There are two types of rabies. Furious is going to be the most common type at 80%. The symptoms are agitation, delirium, hydrophobia, and aerophobia, where attempting to drink or having air blown in their face causes these pharyngeal spasms. Excessive salivation, convulsions, Autonomic dysfunction leads to arrhythmias, hypotension, and then death. In the paralytic type, this is gonna be more neurologic manifestation. So priaprism, which is a pathological erection, anisocoria, where you have um, different pupil sizes, facial palsy, progressive paralysis makes it to the diaphragm, and then that causes death. The diagnosis for this, if you can get that animal, you can euthanize the animal and take a test directly from the brain tissue. You take a sample and analyze it for that. If you don't have access to that animal, you can do a nuchal skin biopsy because the rabies antigen is in the cutaneous nerves of the neck. You can also do a salivary PCR genetic test for that. For treatment, if the patient presents directly after the bite, you wanna debride the wound, get off as much contaminated tissue as you can you would give them a rabies vaccine at the bite site, and then you would want to give them an infusion of human rabies immunoglobulin. There is 100% mortality rate from respiratory failure with either of these types within one week of the emergence of the neurological symptoms. We want to prevent this as much as we can with vaccines. So those high risk reservoir are dogs, our cats. That's why they are required by law to have a rabies vaccine because you're trying to reduce the transmission. Next, let's talk about influenza. This is very common. We have type A, type B, and H1N1. Type A is going to be the more severe form. This peaks in November and December. Type B is going to be a milder form that usually peaks in January and February. And H1 is going to, H1N1 is going to be a more severe variant of type A. The history for this one is kind of nonspecific, but big key point here is myalgias. When somebody has influenza, they are much more likely to have myalgia as the presenting complaint. They feel like they got hit by a Mack truck. Fever, chills, headaches, sinus pressure, fatigue, dry cough are all nonspecific. In the question, look for mentions of you know, sick contacts that were just diagnosed with the flu or the person did not get a flu shot that year. On physical exam, they will appear ill. They look sick. Fever is more common in influenza than it is in a common cold. Clear fluid behind the tympanic membrane or pharyngeal erythema, those are nonspecific. We know this is highly contagious. We know it's very common. And we know that some people can develop a secondary pneumonia after influenza. How we diagnose this, this is going to be a nasopharyngeal swab, goes all the way back up to the brain, a rapid flu test that can be done in any office. 
If we think this might be H1N1, we could do a PCR, a more formal genetic test. We wanna prevent the flu as much as possible with the vaccine that's typically given in October. The in inactivated or IM intramuscular shot can be given for anybody older than six months and pregnant women. Excuse me, that's given, that's indicated for six months and pregnant women. You don't want to give the flu mist or the live attenuated to children less than six months or pregnant women. Uh, you can have flu symptoms that are mild or injection site pain or reaction with that injection. People say, I got the flu shot from my flu shot, or I got the flu from my flu shot. No, you didn't. You're getting the immune reaction from that. So you may want to counsel your patients on that. There are antiviral medications that can be given within 48 hours of the symptom on onset. Tamiflu and Relenza, they shorten the duration of the influenza. Next, let's talk about common cold. This is common cold, it's common. It's spread through respiratory droplets, fomite. So you touch something, you're infected, then I touch it, I get it, or direct contact. Here's your exam question. Rhinovirus is the most common causative agent with 30 to 80% of common colds being caused by rhinovirus. Then you have coronavirus, which is 15%, parainfluenza, RSV, enterovirus, and metanumovirus as the less common causes. But remember, rhinovirus is the most common cause. For the history, a lot of things in common with influenza, but the fever and the myalgia will be absent or very mild. The physical exam finding, pretty similar to the flu, clear fluid behind the tympanic membrane, pharyngeal erythema, that's nonspecific. We know this is highly contagious, and then adults have an average about two to three a year, whereas kids have six to eight a year because they're having a developing immune system. This is a clinical diagnosis for this one. Most of the common colds will self-resolve in seven to 10 days. Tell your patient to hunker down, watch some TV. Anti-inflammatories, cough suppressants, nasal decongestants can all help to treat the symptoms. Zinc supplements have been shown to shorten the duration of this. Secondary complications of the common cold can be otitis media and sinusitis. Erythema infectiosum and exanthema subitum. You probably talked about this in your derm unit in, in class. We definitely covered this in our dermatology pod. Erythema infectiosum is gonna be a parvovirus B19 that causes that, that's important. Whereas sixth disease is caused by human herpes virus. In fifth disease, they get kind of a mild lower fever before they get this pruritic rash. And with this one, remember fifth disease, five fingers slap your face. This one has a slapped cheek rash, whereas sixth disease does not. In erythema infect infectiosum, fifth disease, this is gonna be younger age, typically under 15. Most of your sixth disease is going to occur under age three. So it's a younger demographic there. In sixth disease, they get the rash without the slapped cheek. They get a high spiking fever, which means they're more likely to have febrile seizures that are associated with that because that's a high spike or a quick drop. Nagayama spots, these are physical exam findings where they get kind of erythematous papules on the soft palate and the base of the, of the uvula, and that's pretty specific to this one. Both of these are clinical diagnosis. You can do a serum IgM if you want to be fancy, you can. Both of these will self-resolve within a couple of weeks. You can treat them symptomatically. So the fever you would treat with acetaminophen, the dehydrations you would treat with PO or IV fluids, the rash you can treat with diphenhydramine, hydroxazine, or topical medications to reduce the itching. Measles or rubiola. This is a viral disorder that we don't really see commonly in the United States because of the MMR vaccine. But in the question, if you see a child unvaccinated, foreign born or immunocompromised, then you can start thinking about this one in your list of differentials. The history for this one is gonna be four Ds and three Cs. Four D is a four day fever followed by three Cs, cough, coryza, which is nasal swelling and conjunctivitis, red eyes. The rash will begin about two to four days after those symptoms. For this rash, you're gonna have a fine morbilliform rash, that's the bottom picture there, that spreads from the head to the entire body within about 48 hours, and it's usually mildly itchy. Coplic spots is something that is specific to measles and it appears on the oral mucosa. So it's this bluish, the top picture there, bluish gray oral ulcers on an erythematous base. So coplic spots is specific to rubiola or measles. This can be a clinical diagnosis. 
There's also a rapid PCR or a viral culture that can be done for this one. It takes about 10 days to resolve rubeola. We know that vitamin A can be given to people and it can reduce mortality in very severe cases of this. This is symptomatic treatment. So we treat our dehydration with fluids, fever with acetaminophen, rash with our anti-itching agents. We wanna prevent this with the MMR vaccine. This one can lead to complications such as pneumonia, otitis media, encephalitis, and corneal ulceration. Next, we have German measles, which is gonna be the rubella virus that sped, spread through respiratory droplets. In this one, flu-like symptoms, conjunctivitis, kind of sounds like our last disease. Pain with eye movement is pretty specific to rubella. The rash starts about one to two days after the flu-like symptoms, and it's a fast resolving rash. So, so it starts as this mildly pruritic rash on the face, the trunk, and the limbs. The facial rash resolves on day two and the body rash resolves on day three. So it comes on fast and it goes away fast. The patients may have suboccipital or posterior cervical lymphadenopathy. And then there's something called the four chimer sign, which is specific to this. 20% of patients will get petechiae on the soft palate. Think about foreign born unvaccinated immunocompromised patients. Clinical diagnosis or serum IgM can be helpful in diagnosing this one. This one has a faster re resolution than regular measles. So self-resolve within three days, same symptomatic treatment, Tylenol, fevers, anti-itching agents. Here's a key point that differentiates this one, therefore a good exam question. This one is teratogenic if the person who is, uh, comes down with this is pregnant. So it's gonna cause hearing loss, retinopathy, cardiac defects, and fetal death if it affects a pregnant woman. Mumps, this is a rubula virus that's spread through respiratory droplets. In this one, they're gonna have painful swelling of the parotid glands and the testes, and they'll complain about facial pain with any kind of movement. So jaw movement, talking, eating. So physical exam find, we have that parotid duct enlargement, testicular edema and tenderness, and they may get a light morbilliform rash with this one. Unvaccinated immunocompromised, same demographic on this one. This can be clinical or it can be a PCR taken from a blood sample or a nasopharyngeal swab. This one we treat symptomatically. Fever, we treat with acetaminophen, dehydration fluids, ice or hot compresses to the affected areas, the parotid glands or the testes. And then we prevent this one again with that MMR vaccine. Complications of mumps can include thyroiditis, pancreatitis, infertility, and meningitis. Condylomata acuminata. This is a virally transmitted or viral sexually transmitted infection. This one is caused by HPV 6 and 11. That's a really important point. Make sure you know that. HPV 6 and 11 do not cause cancer, but they cause genital and anal warts that are spread through sexual contact. The latency for this disease is one to eight months. And so the patients are contagious during this period. So it's highly spread. For this one, itching and sexual activity is something you should look for the history. On physical exam, they may just give you this in the question because it's highly specific. Non-tender skin colored cauliflower-like masses on the genitals or on the anus. This is a clinical diagnosis, like I just said. You can use acetic acid, which will, which is vinegar basically that whitens the lesions. They look like cauliflower, and this is pretty specific for only this one. We can treat this with topical medications to help to kind of get rid of the warts. So potophyllox, trichloroacetic acid, amiquamod, 5-fluorouracil. They can use an injectable therapy, in, uh, interferon alpha N3 cryotherapy, electrocautery, and excision, but they can still recur. 90% of them will resolve within about uh, two years. The key point on this one is we have a vaccine for this. You want to prevent this with Gardasil 9. That protects against HPV 6 and 11. Herpes simplex virus. We have type 1, which is oral, and type 2, which is gen uh, genital. This is a human herpes virus. Type one will lie dormant in cranial nerve five, which remembers the trigeminal nerve. That's a good exam question. You can have a primary outbreak and then secondary outbreaks. The secondary outbreaks are triggered by fevers, sun, or any kind of physiological stress to the patient. 
this is 25% of the population has this disease and it's a four day incubation. In type one, the primary outbreak, they're gonna have fever, sore throat and burning vesicles on the oral mucosa. In the recurrent outbreaks, they'll only get the vesicles. They won't get the fever or the pharyngitis. In type two, they'll experience those burning vesicles, dysuria, fever, and have some history of unprotected sex in the recent past. On physical exam for this, grouped vesicles on an erythematous base, that's really important. If it's type one, it's gonna be on the oral mucosa, just like you see in that picture there, crusting on the vermilion border of the lips. And then type two will be on the genitals or the anus. This is usually a clinical diagnosis, but there is a test where you can take a scraping from this and you will see something called giant cells on a Tzank smear. That's not used very commonly anymore, but still a good board question. PCR is a genetic way that we can diagnose this. We treat these with antivirals, so acyclovir or valcyclovir, you wanna take them within 72 hours of symptom onset for them to be most effective. That was part one of infectious disease. I hope that was helpful for you. If you would like to learn more, we have two options. For the first option, you can buy the remainder of the review and you'll receive a PDF of the remainder of the slides. If you wanna learn more and take a practice test, we have that option as well. We have two levels of practice tests, didactic and board level, and then a clinical pearls matching exercise. So I'll show you what those look like real quick here. Clinical pearls is designed to be repetition, 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 so that you're taking the most commonly tested concepts and matching it with the disease. For the didactic level test, it's a pretty straightforward level test. Um, the questions are relatively straightforward. There's four answer choices and anything that you answer incorrectly will be emailed to you so that you can study that. For the board level, this is usually a multi-step thinking process for these questions. There's five answer choices. And again, anything that you answered incorrectly will be emailed to you. I wanna thank you for watching this. I have to tell you that this is not for diagnostic purposes. It is only for educational purposes. If you enjoyed this PowerPoint, please leave us some good feedback or subscribe to us. Um, please check out the other units as well. We have 12 other units that outline everything that you need to know for didactic year. And I hope you have a great rest of your day.